on live here, episode 21. Two. Of the, 22 of the Soul Buffalo Earth Report. And this is a really special episode because we have major announcement today about our 2021 plans here at Soul Buffalo and the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network. And we're here with our friends and advisors, Aaron Simon from the World Wale Fund and John Hothavar from Greenpeace. Welcome, my friends. Thank you. Hi there. So today we're gonna to be talking about a global treaty for plastic and a dialogue series that we are running together with both of your organizations with World Wildlife Fund and Greenpeace next year to bring together a vast array of stakeholders around this issue. So really excited and uh, it'd be great if you guys could just take a quick second to introduce yourselves and what you guys do for your respective major global organizations. Karen, sure. first. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm Erin Simon, uh, head of plastic waste and business here at World Wildlife Fund. Uh, my role is just to connect the dots on the plastic waste issues um, uh, in a way to leverage the power of the private sector and the role that they have to play in solving for this. And there's a lot of overlap um, when you're trying to drive for systems change, which is what we need in plastic waste, um, with the leverage that companies have in their own supply chains, but also the leverage they have in um, influencing policymakers and, and individuals. And so how can we use that power for good? And so that's what a lot of this, uh, as we think about the global treaty, it's about convening all of those stakeholders together. Um, so excited to be here, looking forward to the conversation. John? Thanks, Aaron. I'm John Hosevar, I oversee the oceans programs for Greenpeace US. Um, and one of those is our work on plastic. The global campaign is coordinated out of our office. And um, it's a mix of science, policy, uh, corporate engagement, public education, and the kinds of things that most people probably think of first when they think of Greenpeace. Um, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, guys. So let me just take a minute, 90 seconds maybe, let's see how long it takes me, just to paint an overview of what we're talking about, of what the global treaty could be. You know, a lot of people are referring to it as the Paris Accord our Paris Agreement for plastic, which is I think good to root it in. I mean, we are definitely looking at uh, something that's driven by the UN that would govern this issue, you know, on behalf of the entire world and lots of nuances involved. But, you know, just to root into the issue a little bit, I mean, plastic is a paradox. It's a part wonder material. There's really difficult for other uh, materials to replace a lot of its function, but it's also part environmental scourge. And we are seeing it, you know, all over the environment, in the oceans, in the mountains. Um, there's been some studies that it's been raining plastic. It's ending up in our bodies. I mean, it's a really critical issue where over 8 million metric tons a year are ending up in our ocean, um, you know, and that's equivalent to one garbage truck every minute of every day. So. COVID's made it significantly worse with all the personal protective gear, 129 billion masks that could cover the entire country of Switzerland in a year, just to give you a visual, mountains and all. Commodity prices have been really low, which has made it very tricky for other materials to compete with plastic. Uh, recycling programs have been shuttered around the world, both here in the US, in the Western world, in the global South, directly uh, as a as, as a response to the really challenging economics times that, that have been a part of this. You know, recently this year, we've seen some pretty major reports come out. Breaking the Plastic Wave was a landmark one that came out by Systemic and Pew. And they basically said, for us to have any chance of solving this issue in the next 20 years, we need to scale up solutions across the board, upstream and downstream, and, uh, and dramatically there really is no time to wait here. And I think one of the most complex things, and we're really going to, to, to dig into this, and this is the main reason why a treaty is so important, is this is a just a complex and chaotic stakeholder map. You have 193 United Nations recognized countries. You have a financial system and all the players underneath of that, a highly competitive plastic value chain you know, fr from commodity commodities, which would be like your oil and gas companies, your petrochemical companies, cons uh, your packaging converters that make the plastic products, the consumer packaged good companies that put their products in these goods, the retailers that sell them, and then the waste management companies and a billion other uh, companies that you could put in some sort of variety of mapping around the value chain. And 
uh, activists and industry NGOs, and then really confused consumer that's only recycling like 10 to 14% a year, not to mention 15 million waste pickers, mostly in the developing world that are you know, really having a difficult time and they're relying on bringing recycled plastic to, uh, to pay, put dinner on the table every night. So, you know, you know, as a network, as the Ocean Plastic Leadership Network, we're the we're the only activist and industry network. We really want to have all solutions at the table together with respect to this. And I think like what's happened in 2020, there's been three major reports that have come out, one of which by World Wildlife Fund and Alan MacArthur Foundation. That's all about a business case for plastic. Uh, a huge government report that came out from the Nordic Council of Ministers that's all about uh, what the framework could look like. It's 148 pages and it's uh, it's worth the read and it's all pretty fascinating if you uh, if you can dig in there. And then the environmental NGOs also put out a report uh, from CL, Gaia and EIA that uh, Greenpeace supports and that the Break Free from Plastic movement supports. So what we're doing next year is bringing so many different stakeholders together to talk about uh, this treaty. Uh, we're doing four conferences over the course of the year. We're doing a lot of working sessions. So I, I want to stop there um, and and ask you guys, why do we need a treaty in your minds? Um, Aaron, maybe you can go first. Yeah. I mean, I think it starts with basically we're talking about a global problem, right? And so if it's a large scale problem, you need an equally large scale response. And um, many other comparable environmental issues ha are governed through a dedicated international legal framework. Like you mentioned, the Paris Agreement and plastic pollution, this is an issue that is growing in scale, right? And so it has transboundary scope of impact and it isn't governed by one. And the idea is that the new treaty could fill the gap, um, this legal gap, and establish proper governance structure for dealing with marine um, plastic pollution. And I think that some people would say that like the existing governance um, structure might do that, but I think it's just too fragmented, costly and ineffective. Um, we need to move beyond sort of voluntary initiatives that have laid some good foundation um, in many areas, but lack sufficient support and scale to drive the systems change. And so uh, that is why I think it's really important that we come together with a common vision that we're all aligned under as we are we are each taking, playing our roles as individual institutions and stakeholders and helping to solve for it. Thanks, John. Well, that sounds about right. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, we all understand that science is strong and solid enough that um, we have to do something, right? That we can't continue on as we are, that we can't continue to increase plastic production uh, especially of single-use plastic, and expect that everything is going to be okay. Things are um, already getting pretty serious with impacts not just on marine life and the whole ecosystems in the ocean, but on human health and really the whole planet. Yeah. Um, so this is this is our moment. Okay, we realize that the way that we've been operating over the past 50 years or more. Um, is not sustainable and that we have to do something different. So this treaty needs to be the kind of scale that matches the scope of the problem. I mean, interestingly, we talk about the current situation that breaking the plastic wave report that I mentioned earlier. I mean, right now there's, according to that report, there's 2 billion people that don't have access to waste management that you either have to burn their trash or they dump it somewhere or figure out some way to get rid of it because there's there's no collection. And in the next 20 years, that number is expected to jump to 3.7 billion. Mm -hmm. So you start to model this out, it gets pretty tricky pretty fast. And I think the consensus, no matter who you're talking to, is that we're just not anywhere close to fixing yeah. that. You guys agree? Yeah, and I think that's why you have such broad alignment around the need for this, right? We have, you there's like everybody is understanding that what each of us as individuals is doing on our own is not enough right that that we can only make that step change to the scale that we need to solve this with a more coordinated collective approach and so when you have activists when you have the public when you have businesses and governments supporting the same thing um you know it, it seems at that point that the clear answer is okay 
we need to have this. Now, what do we need to have in it to make sure that we can deliver, that it can do what we need it to do to make sure that we aren't getting to the, <laughs> to the pretty grim future that the P report stated if business continues as usual. Speaking of this, so the manifesto that came out along with the report that World Wildlife Fund and Ellen MacArthur put out, can you talk about what that what that was all about and you know what those yeah. 50 signatory company, companies, right? Yeah, and let's call it a business case, um, a business call to action versus a manifesto, because we want to make sure we are um, not trying to overthrow government. Um, <laughs> but we need to, right? We needed to mobilize business around this, right? Because at the end of the day, businesses have realized, right, that despite the doubling of voluntary initiatives over the last few years, plastic pollution is just continuing to grow. And so businesses understand they have the responsibility to address the challenge of plastic pollution um, within their own supply chains and through reduction, reuse, recycling. But they need a UN treaty to coordinate the stakeholder actions to solve global plastic pollution um, crisis at scale. And so the treaty really helps to um, I would say address this global scope of the challenge and then stem that transboundary nature of the supply chains and waste streams that these companies are having to navigate. Um, they need governments to help set consistent and, and effective guidelines um, to help curb the plastic waste and achieve it. And when I say that, I mean like that all countries would be measuring waste and material flows and, um, and we would be measuring it in the same way and on a regular basis and that that countries would be committed to investing in the infrastructure to recover what we were using, that they would commit to supporting reductions, that the, that the circle we're depending on is, is getting smaller versus bigger, um, that it would invest in science um, and, you know, so that everybody was committed to the same thing. And, and ideally that treaty could help connect these localized bottom-up activities to those sort of top-down act. Um, expectations and that's what companies need to be successful in meeting their goals and so the business call to action was essentially saying w businesses need to support this treaty not just governments not just activists not just individuals and so um, it was great to have a, a large number of multinationals support it when it came out of the gate in October I think we had 30 signed on at the time and more now amazing and John can you speak a little bit to sort of the environmental movements call to action on this and the report that came out and sort of Greenpeace's position of what like what this should be? Sure. I mean, we feel pretty strongly that any effective approach to deal with plastic at scale needs to include uh, a real focus on reduction. Um, it, ha it can't just be about downstream approaches like recycling or other waste management fixes. We have to stop making so much plastic in the first place, especially single-use plastic. And also, um, we really need to pay more attention to the kinds of things that are spinning off massive amounts of plastic microfibers, which are a huge problem that we're really just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding. Um, it needs to be ambitious. Like We have real urgency here. The, uh, plastic doesn't go away. So all this plastic that we've created is still with us. It's a cumulative problem. So the, you know, the current projections are that the amount of plastic that we use and produce will continue to grow. Trust that. We, we cannot afford to let that happen. So like, the interesting thing about these three call to actions is that there's a lot of similarities in the approach about how, you know, we've done this before, obviously there's been successful treaties that have solved like the Montreal protocol, for example, um, you know, very different from the Paris agreement and the way that was structured. But in the three reports in the Nordic minister reports in the World Wildlife Fund report and in the environmental report really touch on like monitoring and reporting. So like, how can we like harmonize all these definitions so that people are speaking the same language in different countries, because even, you know, in, the same country, people are speaking so many different languages uh, with respect to all of this, right? Like whether it be environmental monitoring, whether it be like data reporting, uh, reporting on national action, then you have like your prevention me measures, which are going to be different depending on the stakeholder group. Like, you know, is you know, how do we address microplastics? How do we address the different pillars? Like John was saying, like, how do we start talking about microfibers? Because largely the packaged goods industry, you know, if you see a bottle floating down the river, they have been getting sort of the brunt of, I would say, the 
outrage for this issue where you have textiles that you can't see. Most of our clothes are made of plastic. If you're in New York City and you wash your clothes, plastic fragments are getting out into the into the harbor, right? So like there, the, all the different categories there, like what should be included underneath that? And there's like standardization and labeling. How can we make sure that people understand what they're buying? What type of plastic? Can it be recycled where they are? Like there's a huge gap, just a knowledge gap on the consumer side there. Um, as John mentioned, like virgin production and use, then you have coordination, you know, how to work across all these different countries, what the, you know, plastic waste trade looks like that was addressed by the Basel convention mm -hmm. and then te technical and financial support. Who's the bank for this? Where does the money go? Who controls it? So there's a lot to discuss. So it's yeah. a good thing we have 14 months to, uh, to yeah. dig, dig in here. I mean, you'll see there's a lot of parallels to this, to what, what is like going to be discussed and negotiated in each of these countries too, right? As there's this like high level commitment to all of these things that we're going to do, and then that's going to roll out at the national level uh, for how each individual country follows through on those legally binding commitments that they make as a part of this treaty, right? And so I think what we want to make sure of is that, um, that we don't repeat mistakes of the past, right? That we make sure that, you know, we've all agreed we need this. We all agree of the, uh, around the, the severity and the risk associated with business as usual. Um, we have like the science that shows us all of that. So I think the challenge to all of us in this next 14 months is to not let, to not lose the ambition level of, and, you know, not lose sight of what the principles that we want to come out in this global treaty that they need to achieve in the environment and for communities, right? We can't let it get watered down in the process. And so I think that that's, I think that that's gonna be the challenges as we pull all those the specific tactics through for those elements, or we think about those, right? That they, that we're, we're considering the, fat, the, the repercussions of those decisions too. Yeah, you know, just to, to ground into the 14 months, again, we, UNEA, the United Nations Environment Aid, uh, assembly yeah. getting together in February, 2022. And this is when they're going to decide whether to move forth. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of groundwork that's got to happen. A lot of discussion that's got to happen. So what we're doing again, is like getting all parties to the table, all stakeholders. What have we learned from past treaties that we can apply here? Whether, you know, John, maybe, maybe you can, you can take first step here, but I mean, obviously Montreal protocol protocol is super helpful. You know, Paris is, picking up steam the high seas negotiations are getting are still in negotiations but love to hear your thoughts one of the things that we've learned is that um you know pretty much anytime there's a discussion about new regulation at any scale that will affect the way that we have been doing business we're going to see opposition from some corporate lobbies uh, and that's always been the case and so we can learn a lot from how that has played out, the kinds of arguments that people have made, and and really what happened once those treaties came into effect. Uh, were the concerns that industry were raising, did they come, you know, how, how, how right were they? Um, so for example, you mentioned Montreal Protocol. Um, that was that was one of several cases where industry was really concerned about unintended consequences and even went as far as saying that if we banned these things that it would do more harm to the environment than good and you know of course that hasn't turned out to be true and i think um here we have enough lead time the treaty is likely to take several years um, that industry can start to prepare for the changes that need to happen um, or they can just try to fight those changes right from the beginning. And I think I think most of us agree that change is coming. So uh, uh, to me, it makes sense to, to start preparing rather than to just you know, throw up roadblocks. I think I would argue that you, you're you seeing that some of that change in perspective from companies too. That I am, it makes me um, hopeful to hear the, you know, that that you you hear them talking differently around policy as a lever, right? Versus something that is going to hurt. You see them understanding that policy is necessary for them to deliver on their commitments, right? So where they might have been in opposition to 
financial mechanisms like EPR in the past. Now they're more, you know, they understand that those things are necessary to get an efficient, successful system, right? So I'm hopeful that as we have these conversations around sort of the writing on the wall, right, around the change that has to happen to get there, um, that there, and the more we sort of, like the more time we have, and so it's nice that we have 14 months, but it's even gonna be longer, right, when it begins the UN negotiations, that that there is more of an opportunity for, you know, innovation to come into play as a part of how we solve for this and a part of how we, you know, meet those basic high level principles that we have set, right, around, you know, redu reducing the amount of raw materials we're sourcing from in the first place, right? What are, you know, what are the new business models that need to be invested in now, um, the new technologies, um, what type of supply chain changes will that mean when you're not sourcing from the same source of past? Like how 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 do we get them thinking about those things early on so that the the lead time for the development of those solutions to be put in place can happen in line with, you know, the way the system is shifting. So I'm hopeful that that will happen. It seems different, but, you know, um, I could be proven wrong. What, why do you think this? Why do you think it seems different this time around? I mean, I don't know about John, but like I couldn't have had a conversation with U.S. based companies in the past about EPR. And now they're at the table. All right. It wasn't when we wrote the business case to have a conversation with them about why the global treaty would be valuable. They have uh, the ones that have been spending a lot of time looking at what their impact is in the plastic waste um, problem more holistically have an understanding that they that. They have like an ambition set for what they need to do, but they can't do it if the system doesn't actually help them to do it, right? And they can't do it with the current like plans for growth that they have right now in the current formats. So they need to have they need to have that systems change happen, and they can't do that without policy, right? So I think that they have had that realization. For anyone who's really dug into the you know the the tactics that they need to take as an institution, they know that those will be futile without the systems change. So they need to be a part of that systems change, right? So I think we've gotten that far, but you know, they, there is, we just haven't gotten to like the actual, we've all agreed on the high level. Now it comes to like, what is it? You know, and I think that that's the part that the UN has to negotiate is what is in it. But could we in the meantime, be setting the stage for, a higher level of understanding of what that should be versus a diluted one. And as WWF put out a, a paper making the business case for a treaty, um, you know, it's clear that there is one, right? Customers at every scale are, are raising concerns about plastic. Yeah. So um, for a lot of people, this, it's going to be a moneymaker to think about new ways of doing things. Yeah. And then there's the personal level. I mean, businesses are run by people and nobody wants their kids, never mind their grandkids, to be eating, drinking, and breathing twice as much plastic as we already are. Um, I mean, this is, this is a, a human scale issue. Yeah. I think it's, you be, with the leadership network and having 70 stakeholder groups yeah. One one thing we're not short of is is across the spectrum of people that want to solve this and solve this fast and that care deeply. But you're right. I mean, when you start talking about the system and that is what a treaty like this would address, it, it does it gets it gets tricky pretty fast. And and how do we make sure stakeholder groups aren't left out? I mean, and I think one of the things that we as an organization just are gonna through through these this series of meetings and these dialogues is to make sure that, you know, the waste collectors that are out there picking trash out of landfills and picking trash out of the environment. I mean, I was in Delhi, we were doing a wildlife expedition in Southern India for a big multinational human wildlife conflict. And I had the opportunity to work with some university professors and do like a waste tour in Delhi for a day. And it was like five years ago, like plastic was in the zeitgeist. I think it was before the turtle had the straw up his nose. Like it was, it was like early days of when, whenever it tipped and everyone was talking about plastic and it was in the news three times a day. And seeing these, you know, the people that were just living in these, in these, in these landfills, these giant mountains on the edge of town and, and, and just being in a highly populated area like that and just seeing it firsthand. I mean, I immediately knew that we needed to start 
working in plastic. And that culminated in the Ocean Plastic Leadership Summit that you guys were both with, with us in the middle of the Atlantic gyre with all kinds of stakeholders. We certainly led to the trust that enabled us to hold these kind of meetings. Yeah. But, you know, I think one of the things that we, we hope to do is to, is to just rep, make sure all voices are represented and to give, you know, the waste collectors that are on the ground an opportunity to speak to the industry leaders and to give the environmental NGOs an, an opportunity to speak to the governments and to give the industry leaders, you know, and in some cases, the organizations of, of you know, multi-stakeholder organizations that are aligned with industry, the opportunity to, you know, it, I think that's the key. And that's what we're, you know, I think we're all banking on is that this open dialogue, this real hard conversations, you know, that there is going to be tension involved, but that progress can come out of these. So I'm like wondering, like, what are you guys hopeful about? What are you nervous about moving into a year versus a year worth of conversations around all this? Well, let me build off of what you said first. One of the things you were talking about was the waste pickers. And I also, we've been talking a lot, uh, we often think about um, the developing world um, where and and where inequities um, and where these environmental issues disproportionately impact those who have the least ability to do anything about it, right? But I think that's also the case in developed worlds too, where, you know, where, whether it's the folks working in waste management or where waste management and landfills exist, um, you know, they also represent, I would say, a mis an, an imbalance in who is going to be infected by the prevalence of waste. And so we want to make sure that we are raising those voices up, too, um, because I think it's going to be important that we are thinking about equitable solutions across the board, whether in developing or developed nations. But what I'm hopeful for is that, um, you know, that we continue on a path um, where we move, we sort of break down what were pre-existing sort of understood barriers about how stakeholders played in this space, right? You know, um, and continue to make step changes with that. And when I say those sort of very big blustery words, it means like we don't fall back onto our roles before. Because when we were doing that in the past, we weren't successful in solving the problem, right? What's been so um, impressive about this, and I would even say was part of like partly catalyzed by that first expedition, right? Was that the expedition forced us to think, all of us to think differently about how what we use in our toolbox and how we work together to solve the problem. And so I want to see that continue, right? We have we've made great strides. The fact that we're having these conversations in the first place, I would have not said we were going to have them two years ago. I would not have even envisioned it. I think is a huge step. But I want, I still think that. And I would argue that that's still not enough. And so I want that progress to continue and that the trust that we build right now, at times tenuous, um, continues to grow. So that's what I'm hopeful for. What I'm worried about is that, um, that we fall short on our promises and that, um, and because we can't, like the, the, the environment can't afford that, right? And so, and I'm also worried that we, we will, um no i think that's enough i'm worried <laughs> i need to be worried about yeah like oh that is what keeps me up at night what about you john i, I am i'm finding real hope in the fact that all of these very important stakeholders are willing to come to the table to talk about something that is desperately needed yeah uh, a solution that matches the global scale of the problem that's a great start. Um, a lot of the stakeholders so far have really focused their efforts on downstream solutions, and that is not going to get us where we need to go. So my hope and also my worry relates to that. Will people come together and recognize that we need to be talking about source reduction? that we can't keep making so much stuff that has no recyclable market, no recyclable value, uh, and won't in the near term, uh, and probably won't ever. And that's, you know, that's the challenge. So to talk a little bit more about the downstream side of things, right? The improving the current system, the mechanical system, building mechanical recycling in places that don't have it, those 2 billion people that, that don't have the waste management infrastructure. 
And then John, I, you know, I think a lot of, there's a lot of hope on the industry side for advanced recycling technologies or chemical recycling. And, you know, is, is that going to potentially be in the, in the treaty? You know, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I don't see it having a place in the treaty, to be honest. I think we should be talking about solutions that have some uh, track record. And, you know, there's no commercial scale chemical recycling happening in the United States. We're talking about something that may someday come to fruition, may someday uh, be cost effective, may someday chip away at the problem, may someday uh, be efficient enough that it's not a, a climate or a toxic disaster on its own merits. Um, we're not there yet. So do we want to spend 10 years preparing and investing in something that doesn't have a track record yet? Or do we want to talk about some very straightforward solutions that we know we're going to need to be dealing with whether or not we have chemical recycling someday? And if, just to finish off, if we do end up having a conversation about chemical recycling in the context of the treaty, I think there will be some pretty important steps that we can take to clarify the definition of what is and is not chemical recycling, and certainly not waste of fuel, for example. Um, we can talk about uh, the need for more transparency. We can talk about um, you know, there are several important guardrails that would be helpful in a conversation about chemical recycling that don't currently exist. So I could see that being a part of the conversation in the treaty. Yeah, I almost wonder if like the treaty should not be prescriptive, right? I mean, it'll be prescriptive in some things about ultimate like targets that we want to have and goals that we would want to achieve to reduce the plastic waste to get to zero, right? But I think that any of the solutions that are a part of contributing to those targets should be, you know, should have guardrails in place around requirements that they can't be creating, you know, that we just be, you know, that they would not be necessarily identified as a part of the solution, but that solutions that met certain criteria around, like John said, things that had human and environmental health concerns, um, prote protections in place for that, and that their efficiencies around energy use, et cetera, and efficiencies around um, what could come out of it, right? Like what the effectiveness of the process, um, that those would be key to those being successful technologies, whatever they may be, right? That they would meet principles versus being about prescriptive about what they are. I guess that would be my hope is that that would allow for innovation, but also allow for some safeguards too. And then on the upstream side of things, in addition to the reduction conversation, you know, there's, I think, opportunities to identify reuse. There's certainly like some sort of uniform policy initiatives. I mean, I think one of the interesting, one of the reasons we decided to do this, and one of the reasons we were in, in excited to have do this together with with both of your organizations is that we've, we've had some pretty interesting conversations about the EPR, extended producer responsibility here in the US, which is unbelievably complex with so many different that's just in the US, right? I mean, it's, uh, 20 bullet points with, I don't know, 20 subheaders underneath and all of these different points need to be negotiated and stands need to be, I mean, it's, and then if you scale that out globally, it's really a good thing that we have 14 months. I mean, and there's no way we could possibly get to everything. Yeah. So, I mean, uniform policy or policy guidelines. I mean, I think that there's, there's a hope from a lot of groups that that could be a part of this as well. What yeah. do you guys what do you guys think about that from like a global perspective? I mean, some places there's no regulations at all on what to do with waste. Yeah, I mean, I think that has to be a part of it. You have to have consistent commitments from countries to say they're going to address their plastic waste problem and they're going to have to follow that up with policies that create the system that does that, that include the financial mechanisms that drive it, that include design standards for what is happening, you know, to include what is not in the system that should not be in the system anymore, right? And um, and then I would say include targets for how they're gonna reduce that versus how it's good. they're gonna do it at scale, right? I mean, like by a scale, I mean, growing production versus reducing. So, I don't know. Yep. Yeah, that sounds right. And I think uh, there will be some important connections to existing treaties uh, where this can support and reinforce 
efforts through the Basel Convention, for example, or uh, MARPOL and the IMO. Um, those are, you know, those are really important pieces of trying to solve all of this. But, um, you know, part of the need for the for this treaty that we're talking about is that those those uh, existing treaties are, are limited in scope. Yeah. So what other, you know, you so talk, talk, talk about MARPOL, for example, which regulates dump, illegal dumping from Mar MARPOL and Annex 5 that regulates illegal dumping from ships or the Basel Amendment that just passed in eight months, which helps bring transparency in the global waste trade. Now that, you know, we haven't, no one in the world has been able to ship their plastic waste to China for, for four years now. So this has really helped in a big way, sort of regulate where everything can go or will go. I mean, one of the biggest things we hear when we talk about this is just the amount of time the treaties can take, you know, from the inception to the time a treaty is actually negotiated. I mean, Montreal was, I mean, Montreal happened faster than most, you know, from the time they figured out this was an issue till I think it was like 12 years until they passed the treaty that effectively solve the ozone layer uh, crisis. Then you got Paris, which is was a much longer and windy road around, it was like 25 years. The high seas has been going on for 12 years. I'm relentlessly optimistic in the sort of Christiana Figueres has the best TED talk ever. If you guys haven't seen it, you should check it out where she's just like her relentless optimism. She was a lead negotiator for the uh, climate uh, moving into Paris and she was instrumental in getting that done. I think we, there's a certain amount of optimism we have to have here, but how can we get this done faster than we've ever gotten anything done before? I mean, and I also want to caveat that one of the things we are definitely very cautious and very, we like, we're not the UN here, or do we have any aspiration to be the, what we're doing is through this whole series of meetings is to try to get folks to sit down and have conversations they otherwise wouldn't have to find out where there could be agreement. So we don't have to waste time you know, on, on stuff where there is agreement because there is agreement from, you know, on, on some things with environmental groups and petrochemical groups, like for sure, there, there is some overlap there, you know, there's plenty of disagreements as well. So how can we do this faster guys? And how can, am I, how can, how can we make this relentless optimism infectious? Cause I think that's what's going to take. I, I don't I, I mean I don't know that we are going to have any power like over the UN right yeah, to to do but I think what this what you know what's sort of interesting is this phenomenon that happens when everybody says we need a global treaty and they start to build it is that it triggers action on the ground already right I mean you've almost already seen that with the plastic waste movement already you've got You've got everybody sort of scrambling to do play to do their part, right? Not always getting it right, and not always doing enough. But there's there's a certain amount of everybody leaning in together on it already. And so I think that if you have this, if we if the UN says yes, we're gonna we're gonna make a global treaty, then everybody knows it's coming. And so there's almost a number of chips that start to fall as a part of that, right? You see countries starting to say, okay, I need to figure out what our contribution to this global waste problem is. That means I need to put systems into place to be more transparent. You've got Basel that's already sort of helping to drive that, which says if you want to ship your plastic to another country, it has to be all the same type. It has to be clean. It has to, you know, it has to be that chain of custody has to be managed. These things are going to sort of I think be you know already triggering actions that are going to be role playing ahead of time, and as that writing is on the wall, you're going to see companies start to invest in different business models because they they don't want to be behind the policy; they want to be sort of in front of it, adapting to it, so it doesn't you know they don't have to make decisions that are even more expensive in the long run. So, I think timing for this, I want it to be right, right? So I would rather not, I want it, so whatever that takes, but in the meantime, I think that we will still see things happening, which is good. It's not like we're waiting for it. Um, those things will start to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to keep driving, right? I mean, we have got to drive to accelerate solutions, you know, uh, faster than we already are, in addition to, you know, having these conversations about yeah. about on the global front. John, what do you, what do you think about speed? Well, I mean, there's enormous urgency to the problem. So we don't really have any choice in terms of acting as quickly as we're able. As Aaron said, it's more important in the global treaty to get it right than to get it done tomorrow. Uh, one advantage that we have that some other treaty processes didn't is that this is something that 
everyone understands we need to do something about. It's not just, you know, people in wealthy countries in the West, it is everywhere in the world. People are already seeing the impacts of the way that we've been doing things and don't want that to continue. They certainly don't want it to get worse. So that gives us a real advantage. Um, and this, you know, these dialogues are going to be really helpful in making the best use that we can over the next 14 months before UNA meets in early 2022. One of the, uh, yeah, I think one of the, one of the, th the, the things that we have going for us. And one of the things that I think was a real challenge on the climate front is that there were, you know, for a while, there still are some, but for a while, so many climate deniers and there's no plastic denier. There are no plastic in, in the environment deniers. I mean, it's, it, you can see it, you can feel yeah. it. It's, it's, I, so I, that's one of the things that gives me hopeful that this is gotten so out of hand and it's there's such a deep realization that we need to fix this that it's it needs to happen you know it's it's like sort of runaway feedback loop that has happened in the last five or you know five to seven years where everything's just like x the snowball has started rolling down the hill and it's gotten worse and worse and worse and there's universal understanding so it's just about just about how so well we had a few more minutes left i wanted to leave you guys a little bit of time if you if you have any closing remarks but you know i, I want to say just how grateful i am uh to both of you and your organizations for uh for doing this with us and for and for trusting us and for you know this is such a big such a big thing that we're all taking on and i think just like the only way we can do it is together and that just means everyone that is involved with this issue really diving in so any final thoughts, Aaron? You know, I I am excited that we're where we are. I am hopeful, and I I want everyone who has a role to play in this, which is basically all of us, to get involved. And I think that um, these workshops are a great a great way to get your your feet wet and and play a role. So welcome, come ready to play. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. Um, you know, let's do this, and that means not coming with preconceived notions about what is and isn't possible. Um, and also I think, you know, yes, the treaty will take some time to negotiate. And in the meantime, let this be the signal about what is coming and what you need to prepare for. And so for any of the stakeholders that are aware and engaged enough to participate in this conversation, uh, don't be waiting until then to take action yourselves. Well, thank you guys. And to anybody watching or any of our any of our members uh, or any 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 companies that that are not yet members, we we are preparing 300 invitation uh, letters as we speak to go out to, to a, a huge portion of the plastic value chain. Uh, and we're an additional batch of letters to go out to, to government folks. And one of the things that's really mission critical, as I mentioned before, is that this is inclusive. And that this is inclusive on the NGO community all over the world. We we don't want to make and put any barriers up to make it tougher for for uh, for organizations in the global south to join. So that is a huge piece of our of our pillar moving forward. To this that this is like truly representative of of all the stakeholders, and that it's very balanced. So. Um, you'll be hearing from us if you are a, if you are a big company in the plastic value chain or somehow somehow uh, associated with this issue in any way, shape, or form. And you know, like I said, just super grateful uh, to both of you. And um, thank you guys so much. More to come, and there will be a lot of Soul Buffalo Earth Report treaty conversations coming up from folks all over the board with this issue. So, with that, I wanna I wanna say thank you. Uh, Aaron Simon, John Hosovar. Let's do this thing. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, guys. Looking forward to it. All right. Have a great day, guys.